Good morning and welcome New Mount Zion Church family and visitors to another Sunday School lesson from the Cross Comprehensive Review of Sacred Scripture, International Bible Lessons for Christian Teaching as approved by the National Baptist Convention of America Press. Let us pray. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Heavenly Father, hallowed be your name, for your name is worthy of our praise. We pray that your will be done. Thank you, Father, for your grace and for being merciful unto us. We thank you for being our provider, for loving us and giving your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, to die on the cross for our sins and to rise from the grave on that third day with all power in his hands. As your word goes forth in the lesson for today, we pray the Holy Spirit would have his way in our hearts and that we will learn of you and respond in obedience to your will. We pray you will bless every Sunday school class that is open in the name of Jesus. And we pray your blessing on the body of Christ. We ask that you will continue to strengthen the under shepherd of this church to bless his family and every member of our church family with the blessings that we stand in the need of. We thank you, Lord, for your name is worthy of all the praise and all the glory belongs to you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. The date is May the 23rd in the year 2021. To our visitors, our pastor, Reverend Larry L. Roundtree II, welcomes you to the New Mount Zion Church family, where we are with God's grace, changing the world through the love of Christ, one soul at a time. The Sunday School theme for our current quarter is Revive Us Again. O oh Lord, I am Deacon Keith Poe, and I will be serving as the facilitator for today's lesson. Leading onward, leading homeward, to my glorious rest above, are lyrics from O oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus, that describe how the love of Jesus leads us through our lives here on earth. Lesson Scripture Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, verses 1 through 9, and the 30th verse through the 32nd. Our lesson focus Take responsibility for your actions, good and bad. Our theme talk Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of the martyrs for his faith under the Nazis, is thought to be a coiner of the phrase, cheap grace. We must understand that grace is not cheap. It was purchased at a great price. We are not here to rest on our laurels. Bonhoeffer was quick to note. To expect to do so, to expect to coast through the Christian life without expending any effort cheapens the sacrifice made on our behalf. Although grace is the free gift of God, to expect to give nothing in return, no effort on his behalf, no praise for a gift that costs Jesus everything, cheats God and us. Thanks to Jesus bringing us life from his death, Esther's courage and Daniel's persistence in prayer can encourage us to take our faith in God seriously as we apply his truths to our lives each day. Now that's grace. We are in Unit 3, Courageous Prophets of Change. With Lesson 12, Ezekiel, Street Preacher to the Exiles. Let us begin. 
the blamers. When Ezekiel preached to the exiles, they responded with cliches that showed they took no responsibility for their troubles. A favorite saying referred to the older generation eating sour grapes, which resulted in the younger generation's suffering. This group of Israelites blamed their present adverse circumstances on the forefathers. They were unjustly punished for the sins of the previous generation. But Ezekiel said that each person has to stand before God and take responsibility for his or her actions. God was not unfair and unjust. The Lord punishes people for their sin as they deserve it. God created all human beings and gives us every breath we take. The Righteous Ezekiel said that any person who lives uprightly is under no condemnation. That includes whoever eats no food offered to idols nor worships idols, has no illicit sexual relations, respects the laws concerning ritual purity, obeys Moses' law, refrains from robbery or violence, and is charitable. They are honoring God. The Invitation God gives out consequences according to the ways of each person. God is not up in heaven deciding to bless someone based on previous family members' behavior, nor is suffering placed on a person because of the actions of an earlier generation. It's essential for each person to repent and make things right with God. He is not a killjoy, wanting our lives to be miserable, fearing his big stick every time a law is violated. He takes no delight in the suffering of sinners. He wants none to perish, but rather for everyone to come into a right relationship with him. That's the personal invitation God extends to everyone. Section 1 is our life need and is intended for small group discussion. Here we are asked to discuss why we do and don't want to take responsibility for our actions. After reading the narrative in the student book, Ezekiel, Street Preacher to the exiles. Notice question one. When do you want to take responsibility for what you do? For question one, we like to take responsibility for things that are favorable to us, that shows us in a positive light. For example, when people compliment us for something we've done, we're happy to say, yes, I did that. Question two, when do you not want to take responsibility? Question two reminds us that we're less happy to accept responsibility for our mistakes when we do things we're ashamed of, things that hurt our image. We like to make excuses or blame someone else for things we have done that would cause us trouble or embarrass us. Question three, why do we need to take responsibility for all of our actions? For question three, taking responsibility often means being humble and honest with others. It gives us integrity and it's the right thing to do. God would want us to admit our mistakes and ask for forgiveness. Also, if you can admit being responsible for your actions, you may be able to fix certain situations that you have caused rather than always accusing someone else. Section 
Section 2 Bible Learning Study Ezekiel's message about God's personal judgment on our actions. Ezekiel, whose name means God strengthens, was the son of Buzi, a priest of the family of Zaduk. Ezekiel, the first chapter, verse 3. What is known about Ezekiel's life comes from the information he gives in his book. Also, his prophecies contain dates more specific than almost any others in the Old Testament. This makes it possible to correlate Ezekiel's declarations with Babylonian records and date many of the prophet's oracles. For example, the first chapter, verses 1 through 3, the eighth chapter, verse 1, the twentieth chapter, verse 1. The 24th chapter, verse 1. The 29th chapter, verse 1. The 30th chapter, verse 20. The 33rd chapter, verse 21. And the 40th chapter, verse 1. Ezekiel was among the Jews taken to Babylon in the second of three deportations in 597 BC. The Lord called him to be a prophet in 593, and his prophecies were proclaimed from then until 571. Throughout Ezekiel's ministry, he tried to help his fellow exiles deal with being so far from their homeland. He taught them that the Lord was nearby to sustain them during their time of displacement. Ezekiel's messages, like those of Jeremiah, fall into three major categories. Declarations against Israel, especially before the fall of Jerusalem. Pronouncements against the nations, such as Egypt and Tyre and words of consolation for Israel's future, including visions of a restored nation and a new temple. A False Proverb Refuted Our scripture lesson will begin in the book of Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, verses 1 through 4 from the King James Version. The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, What mean ye, that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge? As I live, saith the Lord God, Ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Verse 4 Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Through Ezekiel, the Lord denounced a common proverb about sour grapes that meant this generation was suffering for the sins of previous generations. The prophet gave the peoples God's solemn word. He would not punish the innocent for the sins of the guilty. He created all people and everyone is responsible to him or his or her actions. Therefore, only the one who sins will die for his or her sins. Question 4. What was objectionable about the popular proverb, the Lord censored? God took issue with the notion that he was unjust in his treatment of his chosen people. 
Supposedly, while one generation lived in sin, the Lord directed his displeasure on the following generation. Allegedly, this remained the case, even though the parents' children were innocent of any wrongdoing. Question 5. How did God refute the false proverb? God declared that he reigned sovereign over every individual. They were each accountable to him for their own actions. This included only the wicked being punished for their iniquity. A Righteous Person Commended Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, verses 5 through 9 But if a man be just, and do that which is lawful and right, and hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither hath defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath come near to a menstruous woman, and hath not oppressed any, but hath restored to the debtor his pledge, hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment. He that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, hath executed true judgment between man and man. Verse 9, And he said unto me, Go in, and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. God presented three hypothetical situations to Ezekiel. He talked about a righteous man, verses 5 through 9, his son, verses 10 through 13, and the man's grandson, verses 14 through 18. The righteous man does not worship at the idol shrines, does not commit adultery, gives food and clothing to the poor, and does not cheat people. In summary, this man follows God's laws, and because he does, he lives. That is, he will not suffer judgment for the sins of other people. Question 6. How does Ezekiel 18 and 5 describe righteousness? This verse describes righteousness as a right relationship with God. The righteous person daily demonstrates what righteousness is by doing what is just and right in the eyes of the Lord. Question 7. What sins does Ezekiel 18 and 6 spotlight? There are two kinds of sins to which the verse draws attention. The first centers on consuming pagan sacrifices at pagan mountain shrines, along with praying to false gods and goddesses. The second involved adultery and being physically intimate with a woman when she was menstruating. Question 8. What would the righteous man not do according to Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, verses 7 and 8? These verses concern the equitable and humane treatment of others. For instance, there was no toleration for the exploitation of others. Likewise, justice between two parties was administered impartially. Moreover, instead of robbing the indigent, an effort was made to provide for them with food and clothing. In Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, Verses 5 through 9, 
there is a repeated emphasis on those who are righteous doing what is just and right. Readers learn that the way in which people conduct their lives either validates or invalidates whatever claims they make about being righteous. The New Testament clarifies the nature of the relationship between faith and righteous deeds. On the one hand, people are saved, Ephesians the second chapter, verses 8 through 9, by grace through faith. On the other hand, the Father creates believers anew in the Son to do good works, verse 10. Similarly, James, the first chapter and verse 27, discloses the kind of belief that saves is a life transforming faith in which one's character and behavior are changed. This included remaining unpolluted by the moral filth of the world and reaching out to others in need. Likewise, in the second chapter, verses 14 through 18 reveals that a truly active faith is vibrant, being characterized by concern and compassion for others. In short, trusting in the Messiah is authenticated by doing kind deeds to others. When such faith is planted in the soil of kind acts, it has an opportunity to thrive. Get a new heart and a new spirit. Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, verses 30 through 32. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? Verse 32. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. The Israelites accused the Lord of being unfair to them, but God said that their ways were unjust, not his. Verses 25 and 29. Everyone should repent from sin, the Lord said, and get a new heart and a new spirit. Verse 31. Further, God said, that he takes no pleasure in the death of anyone because they choose not to turn from their sins, but rather he wants all people to repent and turn to him and live. Verses 32 and also 23. Question 9. What incentive did the Israelites have to repent? Verses 30 and 31 clarify that the Israelites faced the stark choice between life and death. If God's people abandoned their rebellious acts, their lives would be preserved. In contrast, if they remained in their sins, they would perish. In Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, in verse 32, the Creator declared that He found no delight in judging unrepentant, stubborn sinners. Instead, the God of Israel wanted them to forsake their wicked ways and experience life in all its fullness. Two times earlier in the same chapter, the Lord emphasized similar truths. For instance, Verse 21 puts forward 
the scenario in which wicked people stop sinning along with beginning to obey God's word. Rather than perish, they will be permitted to live. Likewise, in verse 23, the Lord revealed that he received no joy when the ungodly died. Instead, he wanted them to depart from their evil ways and preserve their lives. The New Testament emphasizes similar points. For example, 1 Timothy, the second chapter, verse 4, says that the Father desires everyone to trust in the Son for salvation and in this way come to know the truth. Similarly, 2 Peter, the third chapter, in verse 9, states that God remains patient with everyone. His intent in doing so is that rather than perish in their sins, people might turn away from their wickedness and experience eternal life. What does God require? Micah, the sixth chapter, verse eight, pointedly asked what the Lord requires from his people. He decreed that the covenant community make the following three principles a priority in their lives. Number one, to promote justice, that is, honesty and fairness. Number two, to let persistent acts of kindness undergird their dealings with one another. And number three, to ensure that reverence, prudence, and obedience were the foundation of their relationship with the Lord. Isaiah, the 29th chapter, verse 19. Jeremiah, the 22nd chapter, verse 16. Hosea, the 6th chapter, verse 6. Amos, the 5th chapter, verse 24. And James, the first chapter, verse 27. These requirements progress from what is external to what is internal and from one's relationship to other people to one's relationship with God. Specifically, to be just toward other people, one must display loyal and merciful love. Also, such compassion demands a circumspect walk before the Lord. These virtues are ones that believers today are to strive to fulfill. God still expects His people to treat others with Christ-like love and to live in devotion to Him. We are responsible for our actions, no matter what anyone else does. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, the wife of President Roosevelt, wisely said, In the long run, we shape our lives and we shape ourselves. The process never ends until we die, and the choices we make are ultimately our own responsibility. That echoes Ezekiel's message from the Lord. I will judge each of you according to your own ways, declares the Sovereign Lord. Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, verse 30. Section 3. Bible Application Explore why taking responsibility for our actions is essential. Once you have read Stand on Your Own Two Legs in the student book, notice the following questions. When did you learn to stand on your own two legs? 
Why would we think God believes our excuses? And how do you become someone who always takes responsibility for their actions? Some people learn as children that they have to take responsibility for their actions. Others are always blaming others. We can make many excuses for our actions to other people, but God always knows what we do and why. He wants us to be people of integrity who don't blame others and are humble enough to admit we sin and need him to redeem us. Section 4. Life Response Accept Responsibility for your actions. Adam and Eve did not own what they did. Neither did Cain when he killed Abel. That pattern of human denial keeps us from being the humble sinners we need to be and instead brings God's judgment on us just as it did for the Israelites of Ezekiel's time. Once you have read in the student book, Own It, think about what you need to do this week to move from excuses to responsibility. Sometimes that involves talking to another person to make something right. Sometimes it means facing hard facts about ourselves we'd rather not admit that we have made wrong choices, for example and blame those choices on others or on our circumstances or on anything but ourselves. Sometimes marriages break apart because of just a few words one spouse isn't willing to say to the other. I'm sorry. It's my fault. Please forgive me. The key verse of our day's lesson Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Thank the Lord our God for the word of God and for the study of our lesson today. We thank you for joining us, and next week we will conclude our study of the revival that God brings to our lives with lessons from stories of people who experience revival as they live courageously in God's provision. Next week's assignment will be from Jonah, the third chapter. Let us close out our lesson with a word of prayer. Our Lord and our God. We thank you, Father, for being merciful unto us and for being patient with us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stay safe and be mindful of our quarterly theme. Revive us again, O Lord.